itself because it's so simple. So it can't be that. And if I can just summarize the theory of natural selection, it's in the category of what every school child knows or at least once learned and then forgot. And basically, it's just three facts and a syllogistic inference. It's not hard. Fact number one, all organisms produce more offspring than can possibly survive. And Darwin is a great pains to illustrate that in The Origin of Species. Perfectly obvious for the mother cod that lays millions of eggs at a time, because in six months the oceans would be full, and as I like to put it, they'd be piling up on land at a very alarming rate. But even for the slowest reproducing of all creatures, the African elephant, Darwin makes calculations and shows us that in not many centuries, starting from a single pair, the African continent would be shoulder to shoulder in elephants. So clearly all organisms produce more often than possibly survive. Secondly, all organisms vary among themselves. You just look around any room and you got that. That's folk wisdom. Everybody knew that. Thirdly, that at least some form of inheritance operates, as we understand Darwin didn't know about Mendel, he didn't know how inheritance worked, but that there was a principle of heritability everyone knew, because that's folk wisdom. Short parents tend to have short children, tall parents have tall children, black parents have black children, white parents have white children. Again, that's folk wisdom. Now, from those three facts, overproduction of offspring, variation, and inheritance of at least some of that variation, natural selection follows as an almost syllogistic inference. If only some can survive, then on average, the survivors will be, and this is a statistical phenomenon, not every time, but on average, survivors will be those within this spectrum of random variation that are fortuitously better adapted to changing local environments. And through that, the population changes, just to give a caricatured example, but it's not far off the logic. There's a group of elephants living in Siberia, and it's getting colder because the glacial age is beginning. There'll be variation in the amount of hair that these elephants have. On average, those that are hairier will be better suited to the changing climates and will leave more offspring. And 100 generations down the road, you might get a woolly mammoth. As I said, that's somewhat caricatured, but it's not inaccurate. So natural selection is simple. That cannot be the reason why it has been so difficult for people to accept its implications. And what I want to propose, it's the basis of this talk, is really a very simple resolution, but it gets complex in working out the details, and I think through those details one can understand the essence of the Darwinian argument. I want to put it to you that the main reason why people in Darwin's day had trouble accepting natural selection, and why to this very day, Many people in our culture are unable to come to terms with it if they even know its content. It's very simple that Darwinism was philosophically so radical in its time and to a large extent even so today that it challenged so many traditional Western preconceptions that we simply have not made our psychological peace with it to this very day. And I would like to illustrate that argument by posing three riddles about Darwin's life and career, and I'll tell you the structure of this before I get into it. The solution to each of these three riddles illustrates one of the philosophically radical features of the theory of natural selection. Remember, it's the theory I'm talking about. The fact of evolution itself may have certain radical implications relative to some people's religious views, but is not in itself that unacceptable, and wasn't historically. People did, I mean, you can tell a version of the fact of evolution that fits all your prejudices about progress and direction and predictability and human transcendence. But you can't do that within the philosophically radical characteristics of Darwin's theory of natural selection. That's what I'm emphasizing. So in the solution to each of these three riddles, I will try and exemplify one of the radical characteristics of Darwinism, of natural selection, as a theory of evolutionary mechanics and I think when we put the three of them together, we'll get some sense about why Darwinism is so exciting, so radical, and to this day, challenging to preconceptions that many of us have in Western culture. I'll set out the three riddles at the beginning, then I'll cycle through and treat them each in turn. The first one is, who was the naturalist on board HMS Beagle? And obviously the answer isn't Darwin, or I wouldn't be posing it. And I don't want to be overly radical. I'm not going to tell you that Darwin wasn't there. We all know he was on the Beagle for five years, but he did not sail as the official ship's naturalist, though rumor and legend has it that he did, and that's an interesting story to which we return. Second riddle, why did Darwin not use the word evolution? And he didn't. It's not what he called the process. He called it descent with modification. 
And he resisted actively using the term evolution to describe this process, though he finally succumbed in his very last book on earthworms, written a year before his death. Why didn't he use the word evolution? And thirdly, why did he delay the publication of these views for so long? Darwin developed the theory of natural selection in 1838, came back from the Beagle Voyage in 1836, lived in London keeping copious notebooks, talking to men of science and economics all over. Developed the theory in 1838, was an ambitious man, very zealous of his priorities, though genial and kind to a fault, but certainly not lacking in ambition, knew what he had, knew how important it was, wrote two long sketches in 1842 and 1844, told his wife that if he should die before writing his major book, that these alone, of anything in manuscript, she should publish. So he certainly knew what he had, he was certainly zealous of it appearing, and yet he delayed 20 years and did not publish until Wallace had developed the same theory, and Darwin got fearful of his priority, didn't publish until 1859. Why the delay? So we'll go through those three.